Thanks. Uh, as Min said, I'm Martha Murray. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons here in the Division of Sports Medicine. And today I'm going to talk to you about some new uh, work that we're doing trying to figure out new ways to treat the ACL. So we all know the clinical importance of ACL injuries. Current estimates are that over a half million patients will tear their ACL every year. Currently, our best solution to this whole ACL injury epidemic is prevention. And Greg Meyer and Carl Augustus are going to follow us in this session talking about this. This is clearly the best alternative. If we can stop the kids from tearing their ACL in the first place, that's the best. But what if, despite all our best efforts and intentions, an ACL goes, a patient goes on to tear their ACL? Then what, what do we do? What's the best thing we can do right now to help our athletes? And what's the best thing we can possibly think of for the future to treat these athletes? So currently, we um, treat the ACL tears with an ACL reconstruction. That's our gold standard of treatment. Now, back in the 70s, we tried to sew the ACL back together. We tried to get it to heal. And that's called a primary repair or a suture repair. But unfortunately, 90% or higher of those patients went on to re-tear their ACL and have instability of the knee. So that procedure was largely abandoned in favor of taking out the old ACL stumps and putting a graft of tendon across the knee to stabilize it. Now, that's a very good operation for getting patients to have a stable knee and get them back to sport. However, there are some problems with it, particularly in our adolescent athletes. So in this patient population, teenagers who tear their ACL and have an ACL reconstruction nationally and internationally have a much higher rate of tearing their graft than the average person. So as high as 20% in the first two years. They also have a very high rate of later graft failure. So if we look at these patients 10 years out from their operation, the graft failure rate may be approaching 50%. In addition, they have a high risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So as Min just talked about, 78% of patients, whether they have a reconstruction or not of these young, healthy athletes, are going to have arthritis in their knee at only 14 years out. And by my math, that means the 14-year-olds I'm seeing in droves in my office and in the OR 14 years from that is, is less than age 30, and we don't have a great solution for patients with bad arthritis of the knee that are on young, under 30 years old. So this is particularly problematic for girls. So the peak age for girls to tear their ACL is between the ages of 15 and 19. So that means that if they get their injury here, what's happening to these girls later in life? That's a whole lot of people that are going to have arthritis of the knee at an early age. So we thought, can we do better? So this is a schematic where you can see we've drawn a knee with a torn ACL. Right now we treat that by taking out the old ACL and putting a graft of tendon across. But what if instead of doing that, what if we could put those two ends back together and put a biologic scaffold in between the two that would stimulate them to heal back together? You know, science fiction-like, but what if we could do that and get the ACL to regenerate? Maybe that would be better. And the reasons that we think that might be better are several. So first off, the ACL, it really it doesn't look like a tendon graft, right? It's really not a cylinder. It's a beautiful fan-shaped ligament with broad insertion sites and different bundles that activate at different times and where the knee is flexing. We could preserve some of that if we could get those ends to heal back together. In addition, the ACL isn't just a rope that attaches the two bones together. It actually has proprioceptive nerve fibers in it, that when the ACL starts to get stretched a little bit because the knee is starting to go out of position, those nerve fibers can send signals back to the hamstring muscles in the back of the thigh that can pull that shin bone back and stabilize the knee dynamically before the athlete's even aware that they're doing it. And most of the times they're not aware. That's a proprioceptive function of the ligament. And when we take out the old ACL and replace it, those nerves haven't been shown to grow back into a graft. So that function may be lost with our grafts. We could also preserve some of the biomechanics of the ligament if we can get it to heal. But being in the joint is brutal. Okay, so you have a patient who tears their MCL. Most of the time you can put them in a hinge knee brace that simply supports the knee so it doesn't keep going into valgus and stressing out the injured MCL, and the MCL will go on to heal fairly uneventfully. Don't even need surgery. But in contrast, the ACL, if you tear your ACL and we go and try to sew it back together, even with surgery, we can't get it to heal. And the question we wondered was why. These are both ligaments. They're both part of the knee. They're only about two centimeters apart. So why does one heal so well without intervention and the other one not heal at all? So we did a series of studies looking at that and basically comparing what happens in the MCL after injury and what happens in the ACL. How do the cells respond? How do the blood vessels respond? And I'll just summarize some of the main findings here. And what we found was very interesting. 
We found that in both the MCL and the ACL, some of the basic biologic processes that you need for wounds to successfully heal or ligaments to successfully heal happen in both tissues. So the cells proliferate after injury. They, they make more cells to try to help, you know, they call in the recruits. They make more extracellular matrix or the protein of ligament. They make plenty of that material. And the cells are also able to migrate, so they could migrate into a wound site. But is there a bridge that connects the two ends of the torn ACL? There isn't. Whereas in the MCL, there's this nice bridge. And what do I mean by that? If we go in and we make a, just a simple slit in the knee, um, and we close up the knee, and then we go back and look and see what happens at a week. So we've opened up the knee, make a slit in the MCL, slit in the ACL, close it up, go back at a week. This is what we see. And you can see for the medial collateral ligament, which heals successfully, that slit has been filled in with a beautiful scaffold material that's releasing FGF2, which is just one of the growth factors we need for early healing. But if we look at a whole spectrum of 24 different things, all of these things are being expressed in the right time in that nice wound. In contrast, in the ACL, not only is there no FGF2, there's nothing. It's just empty. There's an open defect there for the ACL. No place for any wound healing to occur. And why is that? Well, if we go back and we think about how, wo how wounds normally heal, the MCL, your skin, Achilles tendon, what happens is when you get a wound, there's fibrinogen that's circulating in your blood as one of the plasma proteins, and it gets cleaved by something called thrombin uh, uh, when you get an injury to make this sticky fibrin platelet net that's a little, it's like a blood clot, and it solidifies in the wound site, and it acts as your scaffold to fill in the gaps between the two edges of the wound. The surrounding cells from the healthy tissue on either side can then grow into that and reconnect the tissue, whatever it is, whether it's your skin or your MCL. And as those cells crawl in, they gradually release something that breaks down that initial scaffold as it's being replaced by collagen and things that are more structural over time. However, inside the joint, synovial fluid, the fluid in the joint, has something called plasminogen, which is an inactive form of the enzyme plasmin that's always circulating in your synovial fluid. When you get an injury, the cells lining the joint upregulate their production of something called urokinase plasminogen activator. And what that is, is that's something that takes that plasminogen, which is not active, and it converts it to its active form of plasmin. So when you get an injury into your joint, you still get bleeding and release of that fibrinogen. The fibrinogen can get cleaved by the thrombin, but now you have all this plasmin around, so you never make that nice solid clot. It gets dissolved quicker than it can form. And that's why when patients come into the ER with a bad knee injury like an ACL tear, this, the doctor can pull off 50 cc's of rust-colored fluid. The needle doesn't get clogged with any clot. The blood can't clot inside the joint. So we think that the reason that tissues and joints don't heal, so ACL, rotator cuff, meniscus, cartilage, all of these things have such a difficult time healing because of this inability for that early scaffold to form for the tissue to grow into. So in the top row, you can see here in the MCL, we've done a schematic. So the MCL tears, the ends bleed, the blood solidifies between the two ends and acts as a scaffold or a bridge between the two ends, and the two ends can grow back together and heal. But in contrast, in the ACL, even if we stabilize the two ends with suture, the blood clot can never form between the two ends. And eventually, just like if you keep pulling on a rubber band enough times, your stitches are going to fail and your repair is going to fail because the tissue hasn't healed. So if that's the case, if this bridging of the wound site is what we need to get the ACL to heal, what if we put in, what if we surgically implanted a bridge between the two torn ends that could hold those two ends together and serve as that bridge for the tissues to grow into and get the ACL to heal? And then we could use stitches, too, to kind of hold things together while the healing was occurring and support it. We call that the concept of bio-enhanced repair. So we have the stitches, but now we've also put in that scaffolding to help support the healing. So what would you put into that scaffold? What would you make it out of? So we did a series of studies looking at things that might work for that scaffolding material and looking at how the cells of the ACL would like it, how the blood vessels would like it, what would they respond to. And we did things like take a basic scaffold and add different growth factors to it. Say, OK, do they like FGF2? Do they like EGF? And what we found was that adding individual growth factors was OK, but it really didn't give us the bang for the buck that we were hoping for. So we went back and looked at how wounds heal again outside the joint, because it does it beautifully in the MCL. All we need to do is make that happen now in the joint. And it turns out when you get a tissue injury, you start off this clotting cascade in your plasma, and the platelets get activated, and your white cells get recruited. 
And the platelets, in turn, then have autocrine regulation of EGF, histamine, VGF on Willebrand's factor. And at the same time, the clotting cascade is getting started, and all these different enzymes are going and making things happen. And then the white cells are getting recruited, and they're making MMPs and TGF beta and TNF alpha. And what we found was that over 4,000 genes get turned on and off even in just the first day after the ACL is torn. Terrific. How are we going to do that? Right? <laughs> So what we need is something that looks like this. So this is a little packet that inside it has different packets of different growth factors and things that could get released all at the right time and in the right place. But gosh, this would be pretty hard to engineer in the lab. It would take us a while. So this is actually a schematic of something that everybody in this room knows how to make, and that's a platelet. So platelets, if you remember, when we looked at the initial part of wound healing, the first thing that happened was that your platelets got activated. So what if we could just make the platelets activate? Then we could get the rest of the stuff to all kick in. And so we thought, that sounds like a good idea, but maybe some of the other blood factors matter as well. So we studied the effect of different concentrations of platelets, different types of PRP. Should we put red cells in? Should we put white cells in? And this is what we found. We found that platelets and the plasma proteins are both critical if you want to get the ACL to heal. So you have to have both of those things there. And actually, the red cells, which are the cells we take out of blood to make PRP, turn out to be really important in wound healing because they're an a delayed oxygen source for the wound site. White cells also release important anabolic growth factors, so things that help things to heal. So all parts of the blood play a role. So after we spent about a decade trying to figure out how to make the optimum PRP, it turns out what tends to work the best for this application is just regular blood. Don't mess with it. It's been working for thousands of years. So then we wanted to test this. So we developed an in vivo model. So it's great to make things work in the test tube, but we actually have to see how it's going to work in the knee, which is a complex environment. So once we had developed that model, we started a study in pigs, and we said, well, great. Let's do this large animal study in 30 kilo pigs. We'll cut the ACLs on both sides. One side we'll do with a suture, and one side we'll treat with a suture plus a biologic, so PRP or blood, um, and look at the outcomes. And what we found was that, actually, if you do PRP alone, it really didn't make any difference. So we had equal yield load, equal linear stiffness. All the mechanical properties were the same, whether you used a suture or a suture plus PRP. And why didn't the PRP work? Well, if we go back and look at what happens inside the joint, as you remember, when we have an injury or a surgery, we get that upregulation in plasmin, which degrades fibrin. So PRP by itself, the main protein that holds PRP together, is fibrin. So if we use PRP alone in the joint, it's going to dissolve and go away just like normal blood does. So what we came to realize was what we really need is a carrier. We need something to hold the biologic in place so it's not going to get dissolved by that synovial fluid. And it turns out that if you use collagen, which is the basic protein that the ACL is made of, and mix it with the fibrin in either blood or PRP, it forms a copolymer that doesn't get dissolved by plasmin. And collagen also activates platelets, so that can start the whole wound healing process. So what we now use is a sponge that looks like this here on the right, and it's basically a protein sponge that's made of collagen and other important proteins in wound healing. And we can put that between the two torn ends of the ACL and load it with our biologic. And this is our scaffold that we use. So the basic concept is to use this protein scaffold, and then you can put it between the two torn ends of the ACL, add blood to the scaffold, the scaffold soaks up the blood and holds it in the wound site, and, and then we have our bioenhanced repair. So we went back and did another study, and now we tested this, so using the biologic plus the scaffold to keep it in place long enough. And again, on one side we did a suture alone, and the other side we did suture plus the sponge plus platelets, and we looked at various outcomes. And this is what it looks like at three months. So this is looking at a knee of a pig from the front, so here's the intact ACL. The middle slide is where we just did suture, and when we went back in and looked at three months, really the notch was empty. There was no tissue there. The ACL repair had failed and the ends had resorbed. But at three months, with the suture plus scaffold, we saw a nice fibrous bundle of tissue. So this is our current surgical technique. Here we have an ACL tear. Basically, we can take an endo button device with sutures attached to it, put it up through a small tunnel in the femur, so the stitches are coming out through the ACL stump on the femoral side. And then we can take the red sutures that you can see here and pass them through our sponge. And then we can pull those red sutures down through the tibia, which pulls the sponge into the area between the two torn ends of the ACL. And we can tie that over a button on the tibia. And then we can connect the green sutures that are coming from the femoral tunnel to those that we've placed into the tibial stump, pull that up into the sponge. So we're left now with a sponge in between the two torn ends of the ACL and stitches to stabilize it. And at that point, we can then add the patient's own blood to the sponge, and that soaks it up and holds it in place. 
When we do that and we look at the results in a, at a year in animal trials, we can see that the bioenhanced repair, so on the right-hand column, compared to the ACL reconstruction in the middle column, the mechanical properties are actually pretty similar at a year for a graft and a repaired ACL. And so we thought, great, so now we have something that might be a little bit less invasive for our patients. We don't have to take a graft. Um, and it, we can also do it with a much smaller incision. So that was good. But the exciting thing that we also found was what happens to the cartilage. And this was relatively unexpected. So in the ACL transected group of animals, at a year, um, almost all of them had arthritis that looked like this on the medial femoral condyle. So a real beating up of the cartilage. This happened at a year in the animal models where in patients it probably takes you know, 14 to 20 years for it to happen. But it was in the same exact pattern and in the same places. In the animals that we did an ACL reconstruction on, a bone patellar tendon bone uh, reconstruction, we saw this very similar cartilaginous changes to if we hadn't done any operation at all. Again, similar to what we see in our human patients. However, when we did this bioenhanced repair, we didn't find the arthritis. And we don't know why. We always have thought that arthritis would happen because of mechanical instability in the knee. But the mechanical properties and the mechanical behaviors of both treatment types were the same. So we're not really sure why this group didn't get arthritis, whether it was because we're saving those proprioceptive nerves and keeping that dynamic stabilization of the knee, or whether it's less invasive, or whether there's something about using the biologic that helps protect the cartilage. We don't know, and that's the subject of future study now. So now we're kind of on this pathway to try to figure out how do we get this going to patients. So we've had an idea to regenerate the ACL. We've defined why it doesn't heal in the first place. We've done some experiments to figure out how to get it to heal. Now we're at design freeze for the sponge, and we're in our manufacturing and validation of this phase in hopes of eventually getting to a clinical trial. So in summary, we think that failure of tissues inside joints, the reason that those tissues don't heal, may be due at least in part to this early loss of scaffold in the wound site so that the tissues can never reconnect. But if we put a bioactive scaffold in there, it may stimulate repair. We think that all cells that are in our blood are there for a reason for wound healing and probably are all important, and that the delivery vehicle that you put, whatever biologic agent you're using to get things to heal, that delivery agent may be as important or more important than the actual biologic that you use. And the bioenhanced repair may help minimize post-traumatic osteoarthritis after an ACL tear. So right now we're working again towards our first in-human trial. We've also developed a non-invasive measure of efficacy, so we have an MRI technique now where we can predict graft or healing ACL repair strength with 95% accuracy. And that's going to be very helpful when we go to try to do clinical adoption and helping us figure out is this working or not for these patients. And we're manufacturing the product now here under GLP-compliant conditions. So until we get there, what can we do? Well, right now, if a patient tears their ACL, we can still try to do the best ACL reconstruction we can that has the best outcome. So we know we want to use autograft in our young patients rather than allograft to help minimize the risk of graft re-tear. We probably want to start thinking about should we save those ends of the ACL that are torn rather than taking them all out. And here what we do at Children's is we typically maintain that stump and make very small tunnels to just fit the graft up through the middle of the remaining ACL in an effort to save even some of those proprioceptive nerve fibers. We also want to make sure we avoid impingement. So a lot of our teenage girls are hyperextenders. You have, if you place the tibial tunnel for your graft anteriorly, as we advocate for adults a lot of the times, those hyperextensible knees will go on to stretch out the graft and we get into trouble. So we have to think about tunnel placement very differently in our teenage girls especially that hyperextend. And also, rehabilitation after reconstruction, this is probably the most important factor in helping minimize the chance of these kids getting osteoarthritis. So we really need to monitor them for overuse. Kids that have had an ACL reconstruction and get pain and swelling every time they play are probably not going in the right direction, and we need to figure out how to change that. And we need to use a return to play criteria that's functionally based, and Greg, I think, will talk a little bit about that today. And the work of Lynn Snyder Mackler at Delaware is also key in this area. There's more information on ACL injury and treatment, so I went through a brief um, kind of outline of what we've worked on here. We also put out a book through Springer called The ACL Handbook, and it's available on Amazon. Um, but it has more, they also have free peaks on Amazon, so you can go and read most of the book, I think, for free. Um, it has stuff about the epidemiology, history of treatment, current treatment, and then some of the work we've done now trying to understand the biology of ACL treatment and healing. I'd just like to acknowledge the students and postdocs who've done the majority of this work that I get to present, as well as our funding support primarily through NIAMS and the NIH, but also some through the DOD, OREF, MTF, the NFL, medical charities, and the Children's Hospital Orthopedic Surgery Foundation. So what's the best answer? 
prevention. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg and Carl, and they'll talk about that now.